welcome back to the Family Life Center. Yay! Aren't you glad? <laughs> Boy, that's been the longest four weeks, hasn't it? It seems like an eternity since we had to kind of go into hiatus again, but the Lord has been good and things are looking better. Uh, boy, they shot up so fast, they're coming down slowly. It's a little bit more stubborn coming down as it went up, but it doesn't matter. It's going down, and that's the right direction. And let's pray that. Yes, and welcome back from the grave. The Crowders have arisen <laughs> from coronavirus. Pretty good bout you two had, didn't you, of that? That, that's right, your whole family's been affected now, right? All right, well, okay, well, praise the Lord anyway. It's good to have you back. Uh, maybe others here are missing that uh, you've had your little journey with, uh, with the virus. But I don't know, I just, I'm feeling good about where we're headed and where God has brought us uh, to this place. And we just need to keep praying uh, that this will end, that God will spare lives and other families. Uh, around our country, around the world, that God will be gracious. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We've got a good service plan. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you today that we can come into this place once again and just to see these beautiful faces. My brothers and sisters in the Lord, whom I love so much, I thank you, God, that you have created the body of Christ uh, for our encouragement and for mission. I pray, Lord, now that you will give us both love and the motivation to tell others about Jesus. Uh, we pray uh, this morning, God, for your grace uh, to abound in the life of Curtis Guy. Uh, we pray that you would touch him. We pray for Libby as she has fallen and broken her wrist. Um, Lord, this family is under a lot of trial and we pray for them that you would grant them grace and bring uh, Curtis home. We pray for the hospital soon. Be with him. We pray for little Brody uh, this morning. Uh, we thank you for Jean's grands, uh, great grandson and Trey and Jessica's boy. And we pray for Brody, Lord, that you will give him uh, the ability to breathe. And we pray, Lord, that you will make those lungs work again and to get rid of that fluid and this little nine month old baby. We ask God that you would heal in a mighty, powerful way. Uh, this morning as we worship, Lord, we, we remember, especially these two, we're praying for a miracle to happen. And then we also pray for all uh, in the life of this church and those who are listening by way of Facebook Live for any uh, trials, uh, mountains, rivers that must be crossed, uh, difficulties they're facing. We ask the Lord that you would meet each and every need. Father, we just want to love you this morning. We want to tell you how much, God, we are grateful for all that you've done through us and to us in Jesus Christ. This morning we've gathered to worship, we've gathered to learn the word, and to encourage one another in the faith. We ask that all three would happen now as we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's uh, praise the Lord, get to sing together this morning. Let's worship him. Good morning. It's good to be able to worship together. And this morning, when we before we came, what did we do? We got prepared. We prepared our hair, our clothes. We got together so we look good. But what did we do to prepare our hearts? So we need to prepare our hearts to worship Him this morning. So we need to cast aside all the things that we think of, you know, that what to enter into our mind to think about things that we have to get done, things that we got to do this week. But let's just erase all that for a moment and just focus on Christ. Prepare our hearts to worship you. The Thank you. 
This morning, we just need to be lifted up into the heavenlies and to sit in your presence and just tell you how much we love you, God. Thank you for what you've done. And oh, God, thank you for all yet to come. The best days of our lives are still ahead for everyone. And that's because of you, God. Thank you. Bring us home, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn in our Bibles this morning to 1 Samuel chapter 21. 1 Samuel 21 is our lesson today. We are continuing our study uh, through. Hey, we're making progress. I can't believe it. We're in the 20s now in 1 Samuel. It's only taken a year to get there, but uh, we're making progress little by little, and we reach what is uh, actually a big turning point uh, in the story of the coming of the king, uh, and then ultimately the coming of Jesus Christ, the, the true Davidic son of God. But we learned this morning that uh, to get there for David, uh, that David's got some trials that are ahead for him, and uh, they're big and they're substantial. And so this turning point that we have reached now in chapter 21, we are now entering into what's called the wilderness years of David's life. Uh, there will be 15 stories uh, that we will read in the weeks ahead about these wilderness wanderings of the anointed king of Israel, uh, about 10 chapters, and it's an exciting journey that you and I are about to go on. Some of the most memorable stories that we know of David's life are going to pop up in these next many Sundays together. Hey, by the way, that's Sunday morning and Sunday night. So uh, this is part one and two. Actually, there's a part three uh, that, uh, for next Sunday, Sunday evening, where we will be continuing to look at this study that we began today. The lesson this morning is entitled, I Won't Despise the Wilderness. First Samuel chapter 21, David went to Nov to Ahimelech, the priest, Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Ahimelech the priest. The king charged me with a certain matter and he said to me, no one is to know anything about your mission and your instructions. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. David replied, indeed, women have been kept from us as usual whenever I set out. The men's things are holy even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on that day, it was taken away. Now, one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg the Edomite, Saul's head shepherd. David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's business was so urgent. The priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistines, whom you killed in the valley of Elah is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There's no sword here but that one. David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. 
that day, David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, isn't this David the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? David has slain his thousands and Saul has slain his thousands and David is tens of thousands. David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Achish said to his servants, look at the man, he is insane. Why bring him to me? I am so short of madmen that you have to bring me this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? May the Lord this morning bless the reading of his holy word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you this morning for this lesson in the word as we walk now with David into and through the wilderness. It's a good journey that we take, Lord, to learn all that you have for us there. Thank you for that. And thank you for today and tonight as we can just uh, live for a while in the Bible and to let the anointed word of God work upon our hearts and to make of us, Lord, to be better, to be stronger Christians, ready for battle, ready for come what may, Prepare us, prepare us, I pray. In the wilderness times of our life, I ask in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, when we come to chapter 21, what we discover is that the break now with Saul is final and David's exile years will Begin And what we discover when we read David's life, it's always interesting just to do a Bible study of David alone. We discover he doesn't begin his life in the wilderness. And we also discover that he does not end his life in the wilderness. Thank the Lord. But he does just do the math. He's going to spend a significant amount of his life wandering around in the wilderness. Uh, several things to note by way of introduction this morning. Uh, first of all, some words that I think just come to mind. First, it's the word everybody. No one is exempt from wilderness times. This is in fact true of those who are the anointed of God themselves. When we think about what brings David here, boy, what a journey in the story with Samuel and the choosing of God. He's the one that's picked David out. He's the one who's been anointed. The oil has flowed down from his head to his beard. This man is loved of God. And yet here we discover, boy, is he about to take an interesting little detour in his life. I think of the words nowhere else. Will we discover here what we see here and experience these things in the desert? We understand they can only be seen and heard and experienced when you're in the wilderness. That's the only place where some lessons of the Christian life are learned. There's just nowhere else to go. He brings us into these places, you see. Because the lessons that the Lord wants to teach David and he wants to teach you and he wants to teach me, they happen nowhere else. You're going to have to walk, as it were, out into the wilderness times of life. I think of the words, does not choose. David did not choose the circumstance in his life. It was placed upon him from the outside. He was pushed, as it were. Out. He was chased into the wilderness. He didn't choose it. And so often in our own lives, neither do we. It's not our choice. <laughs> we wouldn't say, oh boy, this is the number one thing I want in life. No. Sometimes we're brought there. 
Maybe we're kind of pushed out there. I don't know. Maybe this morning you've been chased there. Put some place in your journey that you never would have dreamed that you would be there this morning. Well, I think of the word lonely. You know, David up to this point has had much help. He's had much support. We've seen it in the stories. Let me remind you, he's had the tremendous support of Samuel. He's had unbelievable support from his wife, Michal, and he's had a lot of help, of course, from his best bud, Jonathan. But now we discover he's on his own. And it can be a lonely time for many when we walk out into the wilderness. Finally, I think of the word sovereignty. And so we will discover that Saul is increasingly isolated from the providence of God, while David is increasingly at its very center. It's interesting that he goes out there among the wilderness. But while he's out there, what David discovers is that that is in fact where the Lord wants him to be. He wants him right there in God's providence, in his plan, in his will. All of these become some sort of introductory things. It's as we're standing at the doorstep of the threshold of these stories about the wilderness wanderings of David's life. Well, this morning, what I'd like to do is I would like to share with you this theme of wilderness uh, is a pervasive theme throughout the Bible. And so this morning, what we're going to do together, I'm just going to give you a little biblical theology of wilderness. Tonight, we're going to come back and we're going to look at the key significant stories in the Bible that have wilderness as a theme, as a major theme. Now, we're in one right now. Uh, in the story of David. And then what we're going to do over the next several weeks is that we're going to learn of the Christian journey spe specifically from the wilderness years of David. And so we're going to get a broad sweep, as it were. We're going to narrow down tonight, look at some significant stories of wilderness, and then week by week as we work our way through these 15 accounts of David in the wilderness. We're gonna have a blank page in our little journal of wilderness, and we're gonna be taking notes through each of these stories, and we're gonna be learning more specifically some interesting lessons that we learn while in the wilderness times of our life. Are you the in one? I know the church is. So this, yeah, this will go down in history. We're in, a, we're in unchartered territory, are we not? But what about you? Where are you today? You know, it's, I don't want to specifically define, give a definition of wilderness because the definition is so broad that it actually can speak that term to your circumstance which may be different than the circumstance of the person who's sitting in the chair next to you. But if I, as we go through these stories, you may be of, of the wilderness. You may be saying to yourself, you know, that kind of seems like me. You know, we all, we've already seen the anointed of God are there and often visit these wilderness times. And maybe you're there in your own life. If you are, I want you to pay attention in these next several Sundays together as we talk about these barren times of our life. When I was in seminary, I, I took a class on someone. Um, his name was John of the Cross, and he wrote a book. Uh, he, so he would have been one of the Desert Fathers, um, and, but John of the Cross well, he didn't actually write a book. It ended up in a book. It was called The Dark Night of the Soul. You ever heard that phrase? Well, John coined it. 
And when John spoke of the dark night of the soul, when you read John of the Cross, one of the things you learn uh, in his own life, and I began to learn in my own life as I read him, is that we all come to periods of dark nights where things are just not as bright as, the, as we wish they would have been. So if it's from a metaphor of light and darkness, or if it comes from a metaphor of abundance versus desert, However, these, you see, they speak to us in different ways, but the lessons can, will apply to us, hopefully, as we work our way through these lessons together. Let's talk about the great perils there are in the wilderness. There are, you know, uh, some of you have heard my story of where, what, uh, if, if I can think of one time where I really thought I was going to die, <laughs> and I really thought I was going to perish. It was a time when I got lost in the desert out in the hill country of Texas in the middle of a lightning storm. There are perils, real life threatening perils out there. And let me tell you what the Bible says the perils are spiritually when you get in to a wilderness time. First of all, there's the peril of self pity of just feeling inordinately sorry <laughs> for yourself. You know, let me tell you what the problem with self-pity is. Is that the inertia that it brings? Self, the problem with self-pity is that you just enjoy it too much by one half. That's the problem. And you kind of want to just linger there. It just feels good to feel sorry for yourself, right? But what good is it doing you? Where are you going? Well, you're not going anywhere. That's the problem with self-pity. We see self-pity as a wilderness issue throughout the Bible, Numbers 14 and 2, and all the Israelites, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and they said to them, you know, if only we would have just died back there in Egypt instead of here in the wilderness. I think it would have been, you know, to have died back there, I think would have been better than to die here. What craziness. No, it sounds pretty bad on both ends to me. That's what self-pity does to you. You can't even think straight, and you can't move forward. I guess the preeminent example in, in the Old Testament is the story of Elijah, you know. By, by the way, you talk about being anointed of God, one of the great, great prophets of the Old Testament in 1 Kings 19 and 4, while he, nothing's going right for him. Like everything is just, uh, every, all the wheels are coming off this poor prophet's life. And while he went, so he took a day's journey. Where did he go? It says that he went out into the wilderness and he came to a broom bush and he sat down and he prayed to the Lord. He said, I've had enough of this, Lord. Take my life. Okay, now self, now self pity. It becomes lethal, and it is. And for some people, it is physically. And it's tragic, but it can happen to anybody spiritually because it's death living in the land of self pity. It's a peril of the wilderness. Number two, it's God testing. Self pity, God testing. They both are perilous. Now you say, what is God testing? Well, I'm going, to I'm going to define it for you this morning. God testing is reverting back to old ways, habits, and reliances when things get tough in life. That's what testing God is. And so everything you understand of your Christian life, what you have learned, lessons that you have mastered, the study which you have invested, everything that you've affirmed and have received by God is now when circumstance come, it's put to the test. And you see, it is in this test that we must remember and don't ever forget as to who is the student and who is the master. See, here's the issue. It gets flipped. Because what happens is, this is no time to test God out in the wilderness. 
This is no time to test God with foolishness, with backpedaling, with backsliding and deal making. And that's what often happens when we're put in the test of the wilderness. And so the 106th Psalm, verse 14, in the desert, they gave in to their craving. It was in the wilderness, you know, that they put God to the test. Yeah, that's right. They did. And so can we, if we're not. It's a peril. Self-pity, God testing. And then finally, there is what I call des desertion discipleship. Desertion, where bargaining gives way to betrayal. And we actually, we forfeit that which we have committed to the Lord and we backslide and we go back out into the world. It's an interesting study. I, I debated about making a whole point out of this. I'm not. But I want you to see there is a progression that I notice in the Bible. I want you to note how this desertion, discipleship, I want you to note how Sabbath keeping is always an early indicator of issues in the Christian life, especially in your relationship with the Lord. Exodus 20 and 13. Yet the people of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not follow my decrees and they utterly desecrated the Sabbath. They just put a big X in it all together. And that's always an early, the earliest indicator. I'm always amazed at people that just say, you know, I'm a good Christian, but I don't, you know, God has liberated me from church. I'm just not going to be uh, involved in the church. I always look at people that, I'm, I'm t I've never seen an exception to this. You always look at people like that and just look at their life. <laughs> just look at their life. And you say, mm-hmm. I know, I know you, you say you're a good Christian. I hope you are. But I want you to know there's something about the body of Christ and about gathering together for worship of the living God on the Sabbath. And what it does for us spiritually and emotionally and relationally as people. It's a good thing after we see the Sabbath, I, I think of the word sin, Psalm 78 and 17, but they sinned against him, rebelling in the wilderness against the most high. Sabbath, followed by sin, followed by what I call stiffening. Hebrews 3 and 8, don't harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, desertion, discipleship, weird kind of Christianity that we have today. And yet all of us, you see, we're vulnerable to these perils of self-pity, God testing, and desertion, discipleship. Well, enough of the perils. <laughs> Let's climb out of this hole. Let's talk about some of the possibilities that there are in the wilderness. First of all, all right, let's stop here. Let's change gears in your big truck, you truck drivers. Sometimes I hear truck drivers do that. I can hear the gears. <laughs> I guess that's not good for the truck, but that's what I feel like. Let's just change gears here for a second. Let's get out of all this negative peril stuff. Let's talk about some beautiful things that we find in the Bible that happen. You remember how these things that you can only learn there? Here's some things that I find in the scripture as we just do a broad sweep of biblical theology and understanding the dry and lonely times of life. First of all, I want you to note that there's the first possibility is, is that the wilderness can be a place where doors can open wide like you never would have thunk you just thought everything was closing up for you, didn't you? 
when you walked out there into that desert and were living there for a couple of weeks or months or years. I, I don't know how long you, but I want you to know, doors, this is a place where things happen in the Bible. And I'm just going to give you two. I could give you a whole list, but two that I bet you're already thinking of in your mind. One, shall we talk about Joseph for just a minute? Where did things begin to happen for this, for this man? I'll tell you where it happened for him. It was down in the cistern. That's where it all started. And then when the caravan comes and puts him in shackles and takes him off. Out into the wilderness. And it, become a, it became for him a turning point in his life. Let me mention another name to you. How about the name of Moses? Right? Nothing's going right for this guy either. Until he's driven. This is kind of a, a David thing. He himself is driven out into the desert place. And it says when he gets out there, what happens to him? Well, it's kind of cool because what we discover is that all kinds of good things begin to start happening for Moses. It says there that Moses, he fled and he was led out to the far side of the wilderness. This is Exodus 3 and 1. And it says that he came there to Horeb. That is the mountain of God. That's a cool phrase. And I want to tell you why I love that phrase. Because the word Horeb. In biblical Hebrew, that is the standard word for desert wilderness. It says that he came to Horeb. But what's so interesting in the Bible is that this, by the way, that's, that's Sinai. It has several names. But what we discover is, is that this place that was called Horeb, as the Bible begins to, to move, we discover that it's given a nickname. And the name, that mountain desert, it became eventually to be called the mountain where God dwelled. He dwelled there in that place of dryness. It looked like desert. That was its name, but not when God got a hold of it in that person's life. And so we find for Moses and for Joseph, just boy, things, if I could snap my fingers, I'd snap, man. Things just start, start opening up. Things start happening. Some of you, you think the door's been slammed shut on your life. I want you to know you dwell on the mountain of God. Thank God that he can take a wilderness time and turn it into something beautiful. Well, we find that wilderness time is a place of guidance. We discover there that he leads us sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom by water still or troubled sea. I want you to know that even in the wilderness, still, it's his hand that leadeth me. Psalm 78 and 52. But he brought his people out like a flock and he led them like sheep through the wilderness. And then we find in Nehemiah 9 and 19, because of his great compassion, he didn't abandon them in the wilderness, but it was by the pillar of cloud to guide them on their path the pillar of fire to shine on their way that they were to take. He was leading them. Where is all this happening? It's happening right in the midst of the wilderness that you're in right now. If you will but open your heart and your life to Jesus and let him guide you to where he's taken you. He leads. We also discover that he loves because in the 136th Psalm, verse 16, to him who led his people through the wilderness, his love endures.
forever, said the psalmist. It's love. That brings us there and leads us through it. That the great shepherd trust him, get behind him and follow him. We find that the desert and the wilderness time is a, a place of fresh and inspired thinking. So some of us, that's our desert. Let me just, I'm only going to dwell 30 seconds here with you. But I really like this point, Isaiah 43 and 19. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it's breaking some. Can't you perceive it? You're thinking? I'm going to change that. And you know, for some of us, we live in the world of ideas. And we live in a world, our life, is one in which we need those and we need God working <laughs> in our minds, in our thinking, in our planning, in our creativity. We need his help. Where does it come from? Well, sometimes we think, well, I must be in the, you know, I, oh, wait a second. No. In the wilderness is the place where that well springs up. So it says Isaiah 43 and 19. We see that the wilderness is a place of grace and growth and strength. And we can look at the life of Jesus as a young child in Luke 8 in Luke 1 and 80. And the child, it said, grew and he became strong in spirit and he lived in the wilderness until. Until. Until what? Until he's ready. So God had prepared him. It becomes a place of growth. It becomes a place where the Lord will minister to our hearts. If we'll let him, if we'll seek him. We find that it is a place of miracle provision. Deuteronomy 8 and 15. He led them through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. And he brought you water. Out of nothing. In fact, it was as hard a stone as it could be because that's where the water came out. That's the message, you see, when we're in Deuteronomy 8. It's in the hardest and difficult of times that water can spring forth and provision given you when you're thirsty and you're dry and you're emaciated and you need to be filled. God does that. To you and me. You know what's interesting is the psalmist ups the ante of, of Deuteronomy 8 and 15. And it's where Deuteronomy says that he brought water out. I love the way the psalmist, who I think after reflecting upon it for a while and maybe after years of experience, he said of this event, you know, God splits the rocks in the wilderness and he gave them water as abundant as the ocean. Now we've got an amount. <laughs> you know, I wonder how much water came out of that rock. Well, go, go, go to Samus. It's a, man, that's a lot of water in the ocean, isn't it? Out there in that, out that desert. That's provision. That's how much provision that the Lord gives to us. When we think our life is over and done. And, you know, we just think everything's behind us. And we think it's over and God comes along. And he just stirs his finger in our heart and our life. And what happens is he provides so abundantly that which we need the most. And so we discover that the desert is a place of blossoming and blessing and beauty. Psalm 65 and 12 says the grasslands of the wilderness are going to overflow and the hills will be clothed with gladness. Isaiah, the desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness is going to rejoice and it's going to blossom. Blossom. 
told, I was working in the dark actually this morning out in the garden. Came in, Tony has a muddy mess. And I, and I said to her, I said, flowers are blooming. <laughs> she went, what? <laughs> she said, can't be. I said, no, they are. Overnight, they just whoop, it just came out. She said, well, I, I, it's not the seed. I don't think so. I said, well, I'll just go out and look. They're purple and white, I can tell you. They're blooming. And it's a beautiful thing to see it happening. We thought the old garden was over, didn't we, Billy? But God wasn't done with it yet. <laughs> so, and some of us think that God's done with you and me. And we think there's, I don't see any buds, and I don't see anything in my life. And all of a sudden we wake up one morning in the darkness of times. And all of a sudden we look and things are beginning to happen. And they're beginning to blossom and there's a fruitfulness that comes to our life. And finally we discover that it is out in the wilderness. It's a place of fresh fire and revival. That can come to our lives. I had fun talking with Ronnie Carter yesterday on the phone. I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before. Ronnie said to me something in effect, do you know who Honey Tree is? <laughs> I'm a Honey Tree? I said, man, haven't heard that name in decades. After he mentioned that to me, I don't know, just something came up within my heart in my first days as a Christian. I remember Honey Tree. She was one of these one of these um, Jesus people, you know, uh, in their jeans and their faded jeans and they're strumming their guitars and singing about the Lord. And I remembered back to what it felt like to be a young, fresh, new Christian. You remember that? It's good, wasn't it? <laughs> Of course it's good because you were a dirty, rotten, stinking scoundrel in one moment and in the next moment God filled you with, your, with his spirit. Well, that feels pretty good. It's great, isn't it? Well, maybe that's what you need again. Maybe that's just what the Dr. Jesus has ordered for your life. Maybe you need a, just a fresh outpouring of love, grace, mercy, spirit. You know where that can happen? It can happen out in the desert and out in the wilderness. Happen once in your life. Why can't it happen again in your life? You know, I bring this up because there is this interesting theme in the Old Testament. We see it multiple times. And it's the theme of the scapegoat. And so we can we find this in, Levit in the book of Leviticus in chapter 16 prominently. But the scapegoat, you understand that. The, so what would happen is all the sins of Israel would be put, you know, ceremonially upon this and it would be sent out into the wilderness because that's what happens to sin. And the fresh, blank, new, white slate of life that feels so good, you know, when the Lord comes and just forgives us of all the stuff and we're just we just stand before him this fresh new page of a person before god and you say to him come and write that story again in my life lord of renewal of revival of that fresh fire to fall oh god i need to be touched again it's a wilderness theme See, this time what happens is that the Lord takes that which is dirty and awful and terrible and destructive and is bringing us down. And now the wilderness, it serves a function. Just this is a time of reckoning. Reckoning, you know, with all of that once again. And the Lord comes and he does a mighty work. Well, let me conclude here. 
two things to always remember when you're in the wilderness. Remember, you need to worship the Lord. So now we go back once again to this theme about the importance of the Sabbath. But it's worshiping God in all of our life that I speak of and of which the scripture speaks of. Worship is important when you're in the wilderness. He wants you to worship there. We know this from Exodus 3.18. Go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord has met with us and has said, take a three-day journey into the wilderness and there offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. Let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. That's, that's a to-do in a wilderness time. That's a, that's a to-do on your, on your to-do list. Don't ever forget that. I'll never forget the time that someone here at Shama, they lost their husband. There's no one in this room. They don't, they don't attend Shammah anymore. They've moved away. But she said to me, I just can't go to church this Sunday. I just can't do it. And I said, I understand. It's hard, isn't it? I, I know. Because that seat now is empty. But I said to her, I said, but I want you to know that if you can if you can, I think you may get something out of it that could be helpful, but I understand. And I walked away. I didn't know what was going to happen until what happened happened. And she came to worship and told me afterwards, I am so glad. I'm so glad you said to me, let's worship the Lord in the wilderness time. That's where we're supposed to worship the Lord. It's just to give thanks to God for his love endures forever. He is merciful and he's prepared a, a home for us in heaven. He is a good God and we thank you. This is why when we go to, go to funerals, they ought to be worshiped. They should be worshiped. It's really one of the unfortunate turning points in church history in the United States when the funeral homes took possession of funerals. I love every one of them down there at Johnson Brown, but that sanctuary over there needs to be opened up again where people know that this is the place where the people of God gather and we open up the hymnals and we sing the songs of heaven and we worship the Lord in our wilderness times. May that day somehow come back to us again. We also trust God always in the wilderness. Here's a, here's a passage you may haven't read recently. Song of Solomon 8 and 5. Who is this coming up from the wilderness? Leaning on the one she loves. I love that passage. Yeah. Are you in the wilderness? It's time to do some leaning on the one that you love and to trust him, lean into him when times get tough. And in the wilderness, Deuteronomy 1 and 31, there you saw how the Lord your God, he carried you as a father carries his son all the way you went until you reached the place that he wanted to bring you. Psalm 78 and 19. Can God really spread a table in the wilderness? Can he? Can he really do that? Set out for you and me a place of feasting and abundance. You gotta learn to trust him. 
when the difficult times come. I won't despise the wilderness, says Denise Martindale. Though I may walk alone, not while my God has cause to bless my soul upon his throne. He thinks of me and walks with me and comforts me again to grant my heart serenity as I pray and I seek him. I won't despise the wilderness. God provides for all my needs. He shares of his bounty as Jesus intercedes. For I have a savior who's my friend. He proved it on Calvary with his constant love and grace. He has played, planned my destiny. I won't despise the wilderness because I'm passing through beyond each setback and distress to find God's pastures anew. As long as Jesus leads the way, this true love that I found reminds me every time I pray that my life is homeward bound. Our Father, I thank you this morning. And I pray this morning for all of us who find ourselves in a difficult moment. And that will be all of us at one time or another. God, we need you this morning. And we need these lessons in David and of his wilderness journeys. Thank you for the Bible. But thank you this morning for this place where we've gathered. I pray. That Holy Spirit, that as we sing now, as Ken and Tony lead us, I pray for a fresh fire to fall from heaven. I pray for a renewal and a revival to come as we remember who you are, what you've done, our God, our Savior, our King, our love. You are our Lord. As we see you, may we see what can become of this difficult time. It's full of possibilities in you, I pray. With every head bowed and no one looking around, I just want to ask you, where are you? Do you just need that fresh fire from the Lord? I pray this morning that you'll reach out and open your life, your mind, your heart, and your soul to Jesus Christ to let that fire fall upon you and for God to do his work with you. Ronnie Carter is the chair of our deacons. He's going to slip to the back of this room. He's going to stand there. Some of you need special prayer, one-on-one -on -one prayer. He'll walk with you back to one of the rooms. Well, I know, Ronnie, I want to pray with you and to, to be with you in this moment. He, he'll be there. Father God, I thank you. We know you're here, Lord. Now minister in our hearts and our minds, I pray in Jesus' name. Can lead us in a song of rededication. I'm going to sing hymn number 690. 690. He leadeth me, oh blessed thought, oh words with heavenly comfort brought. Where'er I turn, where'er Shall we and sing this with Ken and Tony?
God bless you for coming here this morning. Ken opened the service by making some kind of wisecrack about doing or getting our hair done. I know Ken doesn't have a lot of hair to do. Um, but some of you may also be thinking somebody needs to do something with the pastor's hair. Now that's a mess. I have an appointment soon with my hairdresser. He's going to do something about this, and I apologize if I look like... We're going to talk about John the Baptist tonight. You may think I look like him. I don't know. I do pray this, though. We've got some lessons to learn in the weeks ahead. I pray that you'll bring your Bible. I pray that you will study your Bible. And I pray that as you're doing that, that you will pray that the Holy Spirit, as you are reading, I pray that the Spirit would pour out his fire upon your life and upon our life together as a church. Father, that's our hunger. That's what we thirst for. And thank you, God, that we can come in boldly. We pray to you, God, split the rock. Let the water, just let it flow out in abundance and to fill us with overflowing with you. Thank you for that promise. I ask, we claim it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to see you this morning on Facebook Live. God bless you. Uh, we're going to actually turn this off. Those of you who remain, if you would like to hang out for about five minutes, we're going to pray together. Okay? So if you need to leave, go. If not, if you can stay a little longer, you're invited to do so. We've got a little follow-up to do with the body of Christ. God bless you this morning.